you know, we were, we were struggling with that, but we'll, we, we think we've resolved that technical issue. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Suzanne. I'm going to mute my microphone and uh, hover here in the background. So Suzanne, welcome and thank you. Great. Thanks, Pete. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attending tonight. I appreciate it. Um, and as Pete said, I'm Suzanne Traeger. I'm the fourth program manager for Audubon New York. And tonight I'm going to talk about how good forestry practices can improve uh, or create ideal habitat for a number of forest birds across the landscape. And I'll also focus on some of the more specific forest habitat components that are necessary for birds. Oh, Pete, did you start recording? Ah, you did. All right. Okay, so here's a presentation, uh, an outline of the presentation tonight. Um, I'll start by first talking about Audubon New York's forest program and what we do, followed by discussing forest birds and their habitat, and then move on to discuss how forest management can be utilized to help provide better habitat for forest birds. And then finally wrap up by discussing various resources that are available to implement some conservation practices on your property, and then uh, talk a little bit about next steps in starting that process. Okay, so I'd like to begin by talking a bit about Audubon New York's forest program. Audubon New York is a state program of National Audubon, uh, which supports a working lands conservation strategy, which means we work with farms, shrublands, grasslands, and forests um, in ways that benefit both people and wildlife. Uh, part of the working lands conservation strategy is the Eastern Forest Initiative where Audubon connects with land managers, uh, mostly foresters, timber companies, and private forest landowners to provide the information and assistance necessary to improve forest habitat for birds uh, in forests along the entire eastern seaboard, or um, the Atlantic Flyway, as we sometimes refer to it. Working with people who own and manage privately held forest land is crucial to improving forest habitat for birds. Uh, since 84% of eastern forests are privately held, and here in New York State, 74% of our forests are in private ownership. So the map that you're seeing on your screen here shows large tracts of intact forests from Maine to Florida that Audubon has identified as critical forest habitat for birds. And it's really important to note that eastern forests provide breeding habitat for more than 100 species of forest birds. And here in New York, our forests provide important breeding, migration stopover, and wintering habitat for birds. So if we zoom in to New York, uh, this map shows the forest focus areas that we've identified as having high bird conservation value uh, by being not only large contiguous tracts of forest, but also providing critical habitat to a suite of forest birds. And I'll talk about those species in just a minute. Uh, there are 24 forest focus areas throughout the state, and each forest focus area is also an important bird area. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with important bird areas or IBAs, uh, it is an international program that identifies areas that are critically important to support bird species. So these forest focus areas are where we concentrate our forest conservation efforts, uh, which includes outreach, technical assistance, and wildlife habitat enhancement recommendations to landowners, and also partnering with foresters. And you can see that some of the larger forest focus areas are the Adirondacks, the Catskills, the Tug Hill region, and the Allegheny region. So here is a, a long list of our target forest species uh, for New York State. So we've identified 47 target forest birds in New York, and we did this by utilizing an assessment conducted by Partners in Flight that identifies regional responsibility species and conservation need. Um, and Partners in Flight is a consortium of agencies and organizations dedicated to science-based bird conservation. Um, you might notice that there's four species that are highlighted in red, and they're also pictured on the right-hand side of the slide, and those are the black-throated blue, Canada, cerulean, and cerulean warblers, and there's also wood thrush. Uh, and those are our focal species. They're also our umbrella species. Um, and so they help guide our habitat management recommendations when working within a forest focus area, and those habitat management recommendations benefit a number of other species included on the list.
So the forest program at Audubon New York is providing outreach and education and technical assistance because we're trying to achieve action. We want to get acres on the ground of quality habitat for forest birds, for the birds pictured um, here. And these are nine of the target forest species that breed in New York's forests. These are just a few of the forest bird species that are experiencing population declines. So this graph from the 2014 State of the Birds report shows different habitat types and the percentage change in the populations of habitat indicator birds since the late 60s. So just to be clear, this graph is not showing declines in these habitats that you see across the top here, so grasslands, arid lands, eastern forests, western forests, and wetlands, uh, but changes in bird populations that use those habitats. Um, so if you look at eastern forests, which is represented in uh, pale purple on the graph, it shows a pretty steady decline, about a 32% decline since the late 60s. So with so much forest cover in New York and the eastern U.S., let's take a look at some factors that may compromise quality habitat for birds that breed in forests. Um, but before I do that, it should be noted that these population declines may be due to a number of issues these birds face, not just on their breeding grounds in eastern forests, um, but also in the habitat they utilize during migration, uh, when they stop to rest and to eat, as well as their wintering grounds. And there's a lot of research being conducted to better understand habitat conditions on wintering grounds in Central and South America and then connecting with those communities and natural areas to identify habitat threats and implement conservation measures um, to address those threats. So it's similar to what we're trying to do here on the breeding grounds. Okay, so what are some threats to forest habitat? Um, many ornithologists and conservation biologists consider habitat fragmentation, both on the breeding and wintering grounds, as the leading threat to and cause for declines among songbirds. And on the breeding grounds, habitat fragmentation results in three big problems for forest nesting species. One is overall loss of habitat. Two is increased nest predation rates from mesopredators like raccoons, opossums, skunks, and foxes, um, cats. And three, increased nest parasitism rates from brown-headed cowbirds. And these latter two are commonly referred to as edge effects because they result from an increased proportion of the forest being accessible from an edge where many predators and cowbirds live. Uh, many songbird species require large, unbroken tracts of forest offering deep interior forest conditions to carry out some portion of their life cycle. Um, there's also a number of factors that are impeding forest regeneration including overabundant deer, which browse heavily on native trees, shrubs, flowers, and forbs. And there's also invasive plants, which, generally speaking, deer don't prefer and therefore don't eat, letting them thrive and outcompete native vegetation from growing. So there are many places in New York where the understory is sparse or dominated by invasive plants, which tend to not provide as many benefits to forest birds as a diverse mix of native plants. So this is a picture of an adult wood thrush on its nest. Um, you can see its own nestlings on the right-hand side. Um, they're a little bit hard to see because they're well camouflaged. And the nestling on the right is actually a brown-headed cowbird nestling. Um, you can see how large the cowbird nestling is compared to the wood thrush nestlings. And this gives it a feeding advantage over the wood thrush nestlings, unfortunately. And, and it puts those nestlings at risk for survival. So again, this is an example of how increased forest edge can have an impact to forest birds, like this wood thrush whose population is declining. So historically, there were natural disturbances that affected the aging of forests, like fires, river flooding, ice storms, and human behavior, behaviors have inhibited some of these natural disturbances. So forests that were once a patchwork of different ages are becoming homogenous. And forest land that is all one age does not provide adequate habitat for many wildlife species. Uh, but forest management can mimic those natural disturbances and help to create a natural diversity of forest types and ages. But in some cases, forest management isn't happening at all due to changes in ownership or the desire to not cut trees. Or poor forest management is taking place in the form of high grading, where a logger will come in and take the best and biggest trees and leave the poor quality 
stock behind, compromising vigor in future forest conditions. There's also forest pests like emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid, which induce tree species mortality and can alter and influence forest composition and structure. And then we also have to consider the effects of climate change on forest ecosystems and how they will respond and change over time. So changes in precipitation, severe weather events, and expanding ranges of forest pests and new invasive species will no doubt be major stressors on forests and how we apply adaptive management strategies to try and improve how resilient these forests may be critically important. So let's talk now about the habitat needs of birds and specifically for forest breeding birds. And this is an important question to ask because we have a lot of forests in New York State. About 63% of the state is forested. Um, so we just discussed some ways that forest habitat may be compromised for Birds, but let's now address what they are looking for to successfully raise their young. And this is a picture, um, again, of a, a wood thrush nest. So to answer that question, my colleagues at Audubon studied breeding birds in managed and unmanaged northern hardwood forests of New York about 15 years ago. And stands were classified and grouped according to their structure. So stands that are mature, resemble each other, whether they have had some trees removed through a light thinning or whether they have not been cut in many decades. So this is this top picture. Likewise, forests that have had about 25% of trees removed tend to resemble each other. As you stands with about half the trees removed and most similar of all are forests that have been clear cut recently and have a fairly uniform structure of dense regrowth. So in general, as harvest intensity increases, Fewer trees remain standing, overstory cover decreases, and shrub and sapling growth and ground cover increase. So because they have different habitat requirements, birds respond to these habitat changes. So to organize the many species of birds that breed in forests into manageable groups, Audubon researchers used previously published studies to place each species into one of three categories. And you can see this on the slide here. They're divided into three columns. So on the right, there are the species that prefer younger forests with fewer, fewer larger trees. So it's the column on the left in red. Those that use any type of forest are the generalist, which is in black in the center. And then those that prefer mature forest conditions with more larger trees, so in the green on the right-hand side there. They then analyze these groups to see how rich or how many species or abundant or how many individual birds there were among the four categories of forests they studied. Okay, so we have um, some bar graphs here to look at. This first slide here shows abundance or the number of individual birds. And the results in general are not too surprising, but the relative values are pretty interesting. So I want to point out that the lowercase letters on each bar indicate statistical similarity or difference within a series. So that is within the early fourth uh, series, so the uh, bars that are in red, the first two bars marked with an A are statistically the same, but they are different than the third bar marked with a B, which is also different from the fourth bar marked with a C. So basically, early forest birds, again shown in the red bars, increased sharply as forest harvest intensity increased. Mature forest birds, which are in the green bars, stayed the same for partially harvested stands and declined only in the clear-cut category. And generalist species in the yellow bars um, did not differ among categories. So this slide is pretty similar, but this is showing species richness or the number of species. So again, early forest birds in red increased sharply as forest harvesting intensity increased. Mature forest birds in green stayed the same for partially harvested stands and declined only in the clear-cut category. And then generalist species, again, in yellow did not differ among categories. 
this slide um, is showing how all species of conservation need in New York use the four forest categories. And so this includes species like blue-headed vireos and viries. And as you can see, relative abundance increased with more intense harvests. So Audubon's research helped us to better understand forest habitat preferences of adult birds. But what habitat do forest breeding birds need after the young fledge? So research that looked at two forest breeding birds, oven birds and worm-eating warblers, and compared the nesting location to where the fledglings moved to during the post-fledgling period, which is the period after the young leave the nest and before they migrate. And they come from really big differences. Fledglings were found in areas that had a higher stem density than where their nests were found. They were also found in areas with lower canopy cover than the nesting site. And the fledglings that survived were found to have used areas of higher stem densities when compared with the habitat used by fledglings that died. So this research shows that birds that nest in the forest interior with higher canopy closure and lower stem densities will actually move move their fledglings to forest habitat that has different structure, and they'll move to areas that have a robust understory. So during the post-fledgling period, uh, birds that nest in the forest interior with little understory will move their young to areas where the forest understory is very dense or to areas of young forest habitat. And it, it is within this dense habitat that fledgling survival is greater. We've discussed breeding bird forest habitat preferences and post-fledgling habitat needs. And suitable migratory stopover habitat is another critical factor for forest birds. Uh, mortality is really high during migration and providing Quality habitat for birds to rest, seek cover, and forage is essential to complete their lengthy travel. And we have many birds migrating through our forests in New York, coming from the boreal forest to the north in Canada. And again, similar to post-fledgling birds, they also seek out forests with dense understory conditions and or young forests with thick shrub cover. Um, so again, this sort of dense, shrubby habitat provides good cover so that birds can safely rest and eat. So in trying to meet the habitat needs of many forest birds that are breeding, rearing young during the post-fledgling stage, or stopping during migration, it's clear that diversity is important. And when we think of habitat diversity, we have to consider it on different levels and different scales. Horizontal diversity is the arrangement of forest types and successional stages across the landscape, and it's also known as patchiness. Um, this photo here shows mostly mature, intact forest uh, with a visible clear cut, and another regenerating patch of young forest near the pond or the lake there. So this, is a, this photo demonstrates different forest successional stages across the landscape. It's demonstrating horizontal diversity. So at more of a stand level, uh, we assess forest habitat conditions by looking at the vertical diversity or the variety of vertical structures and the layering of vegetation in a stand. Vertical structural diversity provides birds with ample places to nest, perch, forage, seek cover, and raise young. It includes not only the uh, overstory canopy, but the presence of mid and understory canopies as well. High structural diversity looks like a green wall when you look at a forest. So to get a better idea of what mid-story and understory um, look like, the two photos on the right kind of um, show them pretty well. Um, again, you get those that green wall conditions where you can't see very far through the woods. Um, and in contrast, the photo on the left shows a forest without good structure. And in general, birds prefer more structure. Structure usually results from vegetation, like trees and shrubs, responding to an increase in available sunlight due to the disturbance of larger trees and breaks in the forest canopy. So 
The full complement of native species should persist on your property or in the landscape. Um, loggers, foresters, and landowners often prefer and favor certain species such as cherries and maples because of their market value, but management should not attempt to eradicate any species from the forest floor, the story, or the canopy unless they are invasive exotic species. Um, sometimes without enough disturbance, pioneer species like birches and cherries can be lost from the forest, uh, but with proper management, um, you can bring them back to the landscape. Um, native species also tend to provide the most habitat value to wildlife. The most nutritious food sources, um, like hard and soft mass that includes berries, nuts, and seeds, um, as well as native insects. Some other important habitat components include the presence of large diameter trees um, that are at least 24 inches in diameter breast height. Um, to offer nesting sites and perches, and to also manage to keep some conifer trees, um, especially if this might be missing from the surrounding landscape, as conifers provide great cover habitat in addition to places to nest and forage. Um, also, maintaining or creating dead standing wood, otherwise known as snags, is another important habitat feature. And snags are heavily used by birds and other wildlife for nesting, roosting, and foraging. Also, identifying and retaining cavity trees is also important for nesting, and sometimes these cavity trees are also the large diameter trees that can be left for better bird habitat. And similar to the dead standing wood or the snags, leaving or adding downed woody debris enhances habitat as well um, by adding additional places to seek cover, nest, and forage for insects. So we've gone over some habitat characteristics of forest habitat characteristics characteristics of forest bird habitat, um, and we know that there are different bird communities based on their habitat preferences or the forest age classes they utilize. So how do we know what kind of forest habitat to manage for? Um, we know we have young forest species like the species pictured here on the right: blue-winged warbler, eastern towhee, indigo bunting. And we have birds that prefer mature forest habitat conditions like black Bernian warblers, blue-headed vireos, scarlet tanagers, and black-throated blue warblers. These are all target forest species too, from Audubon, New York. And then there are the species that use both uh, young amateur forest habitat, so the generalist species. Um, so northern perulas, purple finches, and evening grosbeaks all fall within that category. So before moving forward with habitat management decisions for your property or the property you are managing, it's important to consider these different breeding bird communities and their preferred forest age classes. And we can think of these forest age classes as young, intermediate, and mature, with approximate age and years listed here. So this brings us back to horizontal diversity at the landscape level and being able to provide these different forest successional stages to benefit the most birds. So what is the right balance across the landscape? We know that forest land that is all one age does not provide adequate habitat for many wildlife species. Um, but forest management can mimic those natural disturbances and create a natural diversity of forest types and ages. And to achieve this diversity, you can use a mix of silvicultural approaches at the landscape level. And you can think of the landscape level as being somewhere around 2,500 acres, a few thousand acres. So to meet the habitat needs of forest birds, landscapes should consist of approximately 10% of young forest um, for not only breeding birds, but for the post-fledgling period, um, about 10 to 15 percent in the intermediate successional stage, and 75 percent or more in mature forest conditions. So it's probably obvious, but the size of your property is related to its importance in a given area. So if your property is vast and makes up nearly half of the landscape, you can have a lot of influence over an area. And larger ownerships are typically made up of different kinds of stands, where the owner has the option of managing different stands differently to meet different objectives. So some areas can be kept as mature core areas, while others can be harvested 
more or less intensively to maintain a mosaic of different kinds of disturbances among the mature forest matrix. However, even a small property can have an important influence on the landscape, depending on what it contains and how it is managed. So if you want to know what the importance of your property is to wildlife in the big picture, you first have to take a look at it in the larger context. Your property is like one piece in a large puzzle that is the landscape. So you have to take a look at what is the landscape like around your property? Um, who owns the land? Um, is your stand the only mature forest left in the area, or is it part of the largest single piece of mature woods? Or are you surrounded by old stands that are part of a forest preserve? Or maybe your property contains important habitat components like wetlands, evergreen trees, or other habitat elements that are unique in the area. So for example, in this picture, this landowner has a group of conifers that appear to be lacking from the surrounding area. So they may want to retain those conifers to provide a habitat component for wildlife. Um, not only are evergreens important thermal cover for wildlife during the winter, um, but they are used for nesting by forest birds like Blackburnian and Black-throated Green Warblers. However, if your property is surrounded by much of the same land cover, like the photo here, you may want to consider ways you can manage your forest to diversify the landscape, increasing horizontal diversity and offering forest habitat that may be lacking from the landscape. So once you've considered your property in the greater landscape context, you can then make an informed decision as to what kind of forest management may be implemented to achieve your objectives and enhance habitat for birds and other wildlife. If the surrounding landscape is largely agricultural or industrial timberlands, then there may be ample young forest conditions at any one time. And managing your forest through uneven aged prescriptions to achieve mature forest habitat would benefit birds. The application of uneven aged silviculture can greatly enhance vertical structural diversity within your forest. And this can involve removing individual or small groups of trees. And basically you're trying to create gaps in the canopy and allow sunlight to regenerate understory vegetation. Um, the appeal to this, many landowners prefer these uneven aged treatments because their forest still looks like mature forest with little change. You can approach using uneven age management to improve habitat as trying to create late successional forest conditions with similar vertical structural diversity. So some important features will include retaining large diameter trees, so again, those that are at least 24 inches diameter at breast height, or if those aren't present, you can identify trees to leave that will become large diameter trees. Uh, retaining dead standing wood or snags, also large cavity trees. And we usually put out the, the goal of a minimum of six to eight snags per acre. Um, and if you don't have that, you can always create snags um, by girdling. Um, creating or maintaining dense understory cover. And also leaving slash and down woody debris of varying sizes and also stages of decay. Many of these habitat attributes can be achieved by focusing on um, unacceptable growing stock, which can help to meet landowner objectives. So this is a photo, um, this is a great example of late successional forest conditions. And you can really get an idea of the vertical structural diversity and also of what a canopy gap may look like um, in mature forest. So note the smaller trees kind of just um, to the left of the center of the photo, and that kind of indicates that regeneration is happening due to that um, gap in the canopy. So one species that can benefit from uneven age management is the wood thrush, uh, which is a species of greatest conservation need in New York and is also on the State of the Birds watch list. The map on the right shows the breeding range for wood thrushes, and you can see that they have a fairly widespread breeding range in the eastern U.S. Um, and what the wood thrush lacks in color <laughs> in its feathers, it makes up for in its song, and I'm going to play the song for you. I can pull up this audio file.
Oh, hang on, it's a little slow. Here we go. So it has a very, very beautiful song. Sounds like you're in a magical woodland when you hear wood thrushes sing. Um, I see a question came in um, asking about what does unacceptable growing stock uh, mean? Um, and that's, that's kind of forester um, speak for trees that may not um, pull in uh, kind of high value when harvested. So these are trees that uh, may not be of a large saw timber size, they may have um, flaws in them, they may be crooked, they may be um, just kind of lower quality trees. So um, you wouldn't necessarily uh, get a lot of money out of um, a timber sale by focusing on unacceptable growing stock. Um, so a lot of times we say you can focus on that when improving habitat um, because you can take out some of those some of those trees um, to improve habitat for birds. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so um, the graph on the right is a population trend graph for New York populations of wood thrushes from the Breeding Bird Survey. Um, and it shows about a 3% annual population decline since the late 1960s. Uh, population declines on breeding grounds is largely attributed to forest fragmentation and increased predator susceptibility due to forest edge effects. Uh, wood thrushes are very area sensitive, meaning that they need large tracts of forest to successfully breed, which includes flood fledging their young. In most of the eastern U.S. and Midwest breeding range, wood thrushes need about, 200, about a 200-acre forest patch to successfully breed. Um, although this patch size can decrease a little if the surrounding landscape is heavily forested. So if it's about 70 to 90 percent or more forested. And again, you can think of the landscape level at about 2,500 acres, a few thousand acres. In their northern forest range, though, and in New York State, this includes the Adirondacks and the Tug Hill regions, where the landscape is at least 90 percent forested, wood thrushes require about a 69 acre forest patch to successfully breed. So that, that forest patch size reduces um, when you have a more forested landscape. Um, habitat loss and fragmenta fragmentation is a pressing issue on their wintering grounds as well. And there's a lot of active research being conducted on their wintering grounds to identify additional issues and threats to wood thrushes. So within those forest patches, wood thrushes prefer mature forest conditions with a mostly closed canopy, but they mainly build their nests in the subcanopy layer. So vertical structural diversity is really important to wood thrushes. Uh, management that can promote a mid-story canopy from 10 to 30 feet in height, as well as an understory, will provide more vegetative options for nest sites and safer foraging cover habitat. These subcanopy layers are also critical habitat for wood thrushes during the post-fledgling period, where they seek out young forest habitat. So to enhance forest structure for wood thrushes and, and other forest interior breeding birds like oven birds and Acadian flycatchers, um, you can mimic small natural disturbances by creating canopy gaps to promote regeneration of small trees and shrubs. Um, you can also try to minimize forest edge effects by softening areas of abrupt habitat transition. Um, and you can do this by planting trees and shrubs, or you can try to manage to um, regenerate a shrub community or young forest conditions to soften that forest edge. Wood thrushes also forage in leaf litter for insects, so trying to maintain a healthy leaf litter layer is important. And that can be attained through limiting harvesting activities to the winter months to minimize impact of leaf litter in soil. Um, 
And I did have a question about um, kind of maintaining leaf litter layer uh, this morning. And I know a lot of foresters um, have to practice scarification um, when preparing a site for regeneration, especially in oak stands. And again, these are recommendations. And if, if you, these recommendations don't necessarily match up with some of your objectives, um, you know, that's okay. Um, because the management that you're implementing um, most likely will create great habitat for a number of bird species. Um, so it's also important to note that management recommendations for wood thrush habitat will also benefit many other forest species that use similar habitat. Okay, so where young forest is absent from a predominantly forested landscape, even age silvicultural prescriptions can be implemented to achieve this important habitat type. So things like seed tree cuts, shelter wood cuts, and clear cuts are different even aged harvesting methods that can be used to create young forest habitat. Even aged management, when done properly, um, should promote su successful regeneration of the forest with a priority on enhancing species diversity to improve young forest conditions for birds. And this photo here is showing a regenerating white pine seed tree cut. This is a photo um, showing a clear cut in a northern hardwood forest. This is actually was taken in the Adirondacks. Um, and it shows uh, one growing season after the clear cut. So you can really see what these young forest conditions look like. Um, and more importantly, you can see that it's regenerating. You get a feel for um, of how things uh, grow back quickly after a clear cut. Okay, so species that may benefit from even age forest management um, are cerulean warblers. Uh, the breeding range is shown on the map on the right. And in New York, ceruleans are mostly found in the western part of the state. They're also found in the Catskills and south of the Catskills. And there's a bit, um, a bit of a population just east of Lake Ontario, kind of in the St. Lawrence Valley, uh, way up in northern New York as well. Uh, but most of their breeding range is located throughout the Appalachian Mountains and the Midwest. And I have their song that I would like to play for you as well. Bear with me, it's a little slow. Okay, so their song isn't quite as pretty as the wood thrush song. It's kind of a buzzy upward trill, um, but they're really pretty birds. They're a really beautiful blue color That's where they get their name from. So cerulean warblers are another species of greatest conservation need in New York, um, as well as a state of the birds watch list species. Um, here's its population trend graph from the Breeding Bird Survey. Um, it shows about a 70% population decline since the late 60s and about a 3% annual decline. And population declines are largely attributed to habitat loss and a lack of heterogeneous forest structure on breeding and wintering grounds. In 2013, the Cerulean Warbler Technical Group, um, which is a group of avian conservation researchers from various governmental agencies and universities, put out management guidelines for cerulean warbler habitat, um, which is the picture here on the right-hand side of the slide. The guidelines are based on extensive research conducted on the breeding grounds. And among other things, they examined cerulean response to various levels of forest management. And what they found was that cerulean warblers preferred forests with a residual basal area in the range of about 40 to 90 square feet per acre. Ceruleans also chose white oaks, hickories, and sugar maples for nesting and foraging over other species. And they also utilized large trees for nesting, so trees with a diameter breast height of about 15 to 19 inches. They also chose nesting trees that were surrounded by dense understory, more so than a midstory. And another interesting management recommendation they provide is the inclusion of grapevine in their nests. 
so they suggested that if you can, when you're doing harvest, to try to keep some grapevine available for ceruleans to use as nesting material. Um, I've included a link to the management guidelines. Um, it's right below the, the photo of the, the uh, management guidelines. I'm not sure if people can click on that, but what I can do is also include it um, in the chat box at the end of the presentation for those of you who may be interested in checking those out. Uh, overall, cerulean warblers preferred forests with vertical structural diversity and canopy gaps. Um, so they need tall canopy trees with a dense understory, and they respond well to both uneven-aged and even-aged forest management, um, including a range of shelter wood cut intensities to achieve that residual basal area that falls within 40 to 90 square feet per acre. So the photo on the right shows a pretty light shelter wood cut in an oak forest. Um, and similar to wood thrushes, the habitat management recommendations for cerulean warblers will also benefit a number of other uh, forest species that utilize similar habitat. Oh, thanks for um, sharing that publication, Carl. That's actually the research that I was discussing earlier that Audubon did, so that's great. Thank you. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about forest management, um, but if you recall earlier in the presentation, I was talking about forest threats and that forest fragmentation is a major um, threat to forest songbird habitat. So does forestry cause fragmentation? Um, especially when I talk about even using even-aged management to improve habitat. And actually, research suggests that logging in a heavily forested area does not lead to fragmentation impacts. So clear cuts that were conducted in a mostly forested area did not isolate forest patches. It did not change nest predator populations. Um, it also did not result in higher nest predation rates and it was not associated with lower nest survival rates. And also, again, don't forget that forests usually regenerate quickly after logging. So the openness is only temporary, and soon the area is occupied by young forest. So a challenge with implementing some of these habitat recommendations to improve forest bird habitat is that any harvesting that takes place may not generate much revenue for the landowner since much of it involves removing trees that are relatively small, like pole and small saw timber size, and or lesser quality stock. Um, so in New York State, uh, there are two incentive programs for forest landowners that may help with the cost of conducting some of the forest management we've talked about. Um, the first is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or EQIP, uh, which is administered by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and this is a cost share program that will pay the landowner uh, when they have implemented certain approved management practices, say for forest management, um, also for forest wildlife, habitat. Um, Audubon New York partners with NRCS, and we actually can help facilitate landowner enrollment in EQIP. Um, if anyone's interested about that, you can um, contact me. So another program in New York, it's not quite a, a program designed to address wildlife habitat improvements um, on woodlots, but it is a program that's available to um, forest landowners in New York State. If you own a minimum of 50, 50 acres, the 480A forest tax law um, program um, is eligible to you. Um, you, you might be eligible for some property tax exemptions if you enroll, um, uh, but you, you do have to to a, a pretty strict harvesting schedule um, that is detailed for you in a harvest plan for your property. Um, but it's, it is another program that, that is out there for New York residents. Okay, so next steps. If you're a forest landowner and you're interested in managing your forest in a way that benefits wildlife, uh, the first thing you should do is contact a DEC forester who works on private lands and have a forest stewardship plan written for your property. Forest stewardship plans provide you with detailed information about what you have in your forest 
and provide management recommendations to meet your objectives and plan, really plan for the future health of your forest. Um, from there, a consulting forester can assist you with carrying out harvests included in the forest stewardship plan. And if managing your forest land to improve habitat for birds and other wildlife is a goal of yours, then you can contact a wildlife biologist to provide additional input. And that's really something that I can help you with along with other staff at Audubon New York. Um, as I said earlier, we are available to perform site visits. Um, we can provide technical assistance. And we can also provide habitat management recommendations for your property. And we are also, um, we can work with foresters. Um, we can also help connect you with a forester as well if you aren't already working with one. So some takeaway best management practices for forest bird habitat are to one, think about your property in the greater landscape context and you can help manage the landscape to create some of these four successional stages that are important to birds. Um, also, if possible, avoid harvest during the breeding bird season. Um, so probably April through August, um, but you could also do May through July. That should be okay too. Um, manage to retain habit, important habitat components, such as evergreens, native tree species diversity to provide hard and soft mast. Um, dead standing wood, um, otherwise known as snags, and also down woody debris. And take a look at your woodlot to assess the vertical structure. Um, do you have a green wall? Do you have great layers of different canopies in your, in your woodlot? If not, contact a forester to see what you can do to enhance vertical structure. And here's a photo kind of showing that green wall, showing those late successional forest conditions that are um, really great for a variety of forest songbirds. I have a list of reference material from the presentation, um, which I'm happy to send to any of you via email, um, or you can also retrieve this from the archived webinar on YouTube after the presentation is uh, over. And um, that's it. Thank you all very much. I have my contact information posted here if you would like to uh, follow up with me on anything. Um, so thanks again. And I can try to answer additional questions now if anyone has, has them. Thanks. Great job, Suzanne. Thank you. That was uh, really well done. The uh, audio is perfect as, you know, we had some issues at noon. This this evening was just outstanding. It was, it was flawless. So great. great. Yes. I, at, least, at least on my end and nobody said anything. So um, that's terrific. Um, so this is a chance for if there are folks that have uh, questions that they'd like to ask, this is a good time to start uh, typing them in a, a couple of administrative things while you're thinking about that. When you exit the webinar, you'll receive, you'll automatically be dumped onto the exit survey page. So please take, uh, it'll take just two or three minutes for you to complete that exit survey. That's important for us to be able to gather data on the kinds of things that you're interested in and the kinds of impacts that um, are provided through these webinars. So that's uh, just very useful. Also, some of you are going to be interested in continuing education credits. When you registered to obtain your registration ID code, you were prompted to request um, you were prompted to request a um, you, were, you were prompted with a request if you wanted to be uh, re recorded as a forester or as a master gardener, or master naturalist, or something like that. So you've you've already been you've already done the registration you need to, and I'll be sending out uh, the. Uh, continuing education credit documentation in the, in the next few days. So, um, so I have a starting question. That's my. Uh, that's one of the perks you have as the host is you get to ask the first question. When you were, can you talk a little bit? Maybe you're talking about even age management and uneven age management. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about, you know, to the the extent to which are those. You know, for a, a landowner that might have 30 acres or 50 acres or 100 acres, are those, you know, all or nothing kinds of conditions? Do they need to manage all of their property as even age or all of their property as uneven age? How, how might, you know, is there an example that you can think of maybe of, of how to configure some different age structure strategies on a given property? Sure. So for, um, for, for smaller acreages, um, Again, you know, you want to look at the landscape context, but most most likely, um, 
habitat management recommendations for someone who maybe owns 10 or 20 or 30, maybe even 50 acres, will be to really try to increase the structural diversity in your stand. So doing some small individual tree cuts, maybe some, some group cuts to open up the canopy so that you can get that really great understory layer that, um, that research has shown is, is really vital to breeding birds that may be using your woodlot. Um, and I, I will say too, even though I was talking about wood thrush as an example um, for um, kind of mature forest management, um, they are found in really small acreages. Wood thrushes will breed in one acre plots. Um, that may not necessarily be great for them. They may not be successful at nesting, but they could be, um, especially if you have some, some um, good quality habitat for them to use to nest in. Um, so when I was speaking about having 200 acre, acres for uh, wood thrush, um, forest habitat patch size, um, those are the absolute most ideal conditions for breeding habitat for wood thrushes. Um, but they are commonly found in smaller woodlots, so there's a lot you can do with smaller acreages to, to try to provide um, the best conditions. And, and again, it's really just coming back to using uneven age management to enhance the vertical structure. Um, but Having said that, if you have a smaller woodlot and you are surrounded by a really mature forest preserve, um, you know, a habitat management recommendation may be to do some even age management, to do a small clear cut um, to, so that you are providing those young forest conditions to, to the birds who are using that mature interior forest. We, we know that they're going to bring their fledglings out. Um, to use young forest um, or, you know, dense understory. So, um, so it, it, it really depends. Um, and obviously it, it really depends on the landowner objectives too, what they feel comfortable with. A lot of people are not, not comfortable with some even age management um, on their properties. Um, so that's kind of why we, we get out, we try to do a lot of this outreach and education to, um, to, to get people to uh, maybe provide more young forest conditions on their property because we know a lot of birds really, really need it. Um, not just the forest interior birds that I've been talking about, but um, there's a lot of other um, early su successional species that aren't doing well um, that need it as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so Trevor wants to know if there are any tree species that an endangered bird is totally dependent upon, or is there a tree species or type of, of cutting that would minimize and or regeneration that would be encouraged for endangered birds? So is there, so he's looking kind of like for a, is there a bottleneck somewhere in the forest that we should be particularly um, sensitive to? Right, that's a really good question. So I'm not aware of any really specific um, associations with an endangered bird or a bird of, um, of conservation concern um, that is really reliant upon a, a certain species. But um, kind of getting back to um, ceruleans, um, the, the research that they did really found that they sought out white oaks and hickories primarily for nesting. So to me, that's a really important indication of um, a really important association um, for their preference for where they build their nests. Um, they also chose those birds primarily for foraging as well. Um, so we, we do have some insight into some, some species that, that some of these birds of greatest conservation need um, tend to utilize a little bit more. Um, I know that the, um, yellow birch is a tree that it's kind of like a, a hotbed for wildlife and especially birds. Birds seek it out a lot, um, not only for nesting, but for foraging. Um, I think it tends to provide a lot of great um, kind of insect foraging um, possibilities for birds. Um, and as I said before, uh, with some of these really mature um, uh, even age stands that we have in New York State, you lose some of those um, early successional tree species from the landscape. So um, trying to implement some management that can diversify your forest stand and, and you know, bring up some birches and, um, you know, some cherries um, can be really beneficial to, to birds. So just trying to diversify things a bit and um, not being uh, afraid to have some of those, those early successional uh, tree species pop up. 
um, can be really beneficial. Okay. Uh, Carl wants to know if you could talk a little bit about uh, management for American woodcock. Sure. Um, yeah, so American woodcock uh, are definitely an early successional species. Um, and uh, so doing even age management is, um, is creating great habitat for woodcock. And they actually, they're a bit complicated. So they, they, they need a variety of habitats adjacent to each other. So they tend to use kind of open fields for their breeding displays. Um, they then use um, kind of young forest conditions, so really dense shrubbery um, and, and young forest thickets to nest and raise their young because it's great cover habitat, great foraging habitat for them. Um, they nest on the ground, so they need, they need really great cover habitat for nesting success. Um, and then once they're young, um, uh, fledge. They tend to use, um, again, mostly young forest conditions, but they will kind of use, uh, if there's some mature forest nearby that has a good understory component, they'll also use those too. And they, they really like wet seeps as well. So, um, uh, so if you have any of those characteristics on your property, um, you know, you have the potential for really great woodcock habitat. Um, and so managing for woodcock, again, um, those young forest conditions are going to benefit a number of other species as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and just uh, a jumping ahead, Bob offered that a checkerboard pattern of small and adjacent clear cuts would work well for woodcock. So they're putting that, sure, yep. that intermixture, that uh, matrix of, of variety of age structures. Yes, yes, great point. Okay, Trevor was told not to cut his pasture between June 1st and August 1st in northern Vermont. He wants to know if that's an accurate recommendation for field nesting birds. Yes, it is. Um, so, yeah, someone had that question earlier today, too, and we kind of give um, three, three different dates, um, kind of good, better, best. Um, if you can delay mowing um, till July 15th, that's good. Um, but if you can delay it even more to the end of July, that's better. If you can wait till the end of August, that's the best. Um, some grassland uh, nesting birds will actually um, have several clutches, especially if their first nesting attempt isn't successful. They will re-nest, and so that's why kind of that July 15th deadline uh, may not be um, great. So we kind of give those three options. Um, out there for hay farmers to kind of work with um, to, to hay their fields. Okay. Um, Kathy is making an observation that she has a third of an acre residence in Rhode Island that's filled with song, and yet her 44 acre woods in Maine is relatively quiet. She does hear thrushes. She knows what they sound like now when she says thanks. Oh, the woodpeckers and hawks, but not a lot of variety of birds. So she wants to know, she does have good vertical uh, structure, but, and she's surrounded by hundreds of acres of wood. So she wants to know if that's normal to have a relatively quiet woodland. Um, well, if you've got good vertical structure, um, that's interesting. It could be, you know, birds kind of are more vocal at certain times of the day, and perhaps you're not getting out when when they're really singing, um, they tend to get really busy with their, their young this time of year, although nesting is kind of wrapping up right now. Um, but they are busy feeding their young. Um, so yeah, um, that's interesting. Um, I, I don't have a great explanation for that other than try to get out really early in the morning to, to see what's singing. Um, but um, yeah, if you've got good vertical structure, I would think that you you would have um, you'd have a lot of birds coming to your your uh, property in Maine. Could it be that there's if there's hundreds of acres of woods, is it is it is it too uniform? Maybe I mean one thing Kathy might do would be to go find a neighbor that has had a recent harvest or a, you know an, a field edge or something like that and see if there's some differences there. I mean, maybe there's an opportunity to do some management 
uh, more intensive management on the 44 acres that could create some structural variation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and Herb has a question. Hi, Herb. I owe Herb an email. Um, uh, Herb, but that's an aside. So, um, Herb wants to know if you could suggest tree species that you can plant in open grasslands. And uh, he's asking about mowing grasslands and waiting until August, which you just talked about. So, um, maybe any tree species to suggest for planting in open grasslands. Sure. So I guess I would ask what um, what's your objective with planting trees in an open grassland? Um, are you trying to soften? Does your grassland maybe uh, abut a forest? So you're trying to soften the edge. Um, in which case, um, I would probably go with some early successional tree species, maybe some um, you know uh, species that really love the sun. So cherries and birches. Um, something like that, uh, some, um, maybe even some shrubs, some berry producing shrubs, service berry. Um, but if you're planting in an open grassland, um, that might actually be kind of um, bad for grassland breeding birds um, because raptors will come and perch there and uh, tend to prey on them. Um, so we tend not to suggest planting trees in the middle of a grassland, um, but if you're trying to soften the edge, um, I would definitely look to some great native berry-producing shrubs and some um, uh, shade-intolerant tree species like um, birches and cherries um, to, to start planting on the edge there. Okay. Well, it looks like we've... Uh, and you've answered all the questions, um, so I want to thank you again, Suzanne, for a really wonderful presentation. This was well designed and well executed, so thank you very much. And I want to thank the participants for joining us this evening. A reminder that you'll be uh, dropped into a, 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 into your internet browser window for an exit survey, and uh, we'll see you back hopefully in September on the third Wednesday of September for um, the webinar then. There's no webinar in August. So thank you again, Suzanne, and all of the participants, and wishing you all a great evening. Great. Thank you, everyone.